Okay, I think we'll get going since two minutes past. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as you can see from our slide here, we've got a busy session for you all. Um, our agenda today, we will do welcome and introductions. Um, we'll give an overview of key messages. Um, I'll hand it over to Barry, who will give the weekly mes key messages. Um, we have an update from fellow champion Karen, who's also a volunteer with the vaccination program, and she's going to give us an update on her experience of volunteering um, at the vaccination sites. We'll then go into Champions Corner. Um, so if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask, or have anything that they'd like to raise, please do um, in Champions Corner, but you can also use the chat box throughout the session as well. Um, today's theme is optimal, the Optimal Aging Programme. Um, we have Jennifer Kay joining us um, from CLCH, who's going to talk us through um, the Thanks. Optimal Aging Programme. Um, we'll have time for questions and discussion. Um, and then next steps, and we'll finish by one. Um, so welcome to any new champions joining us this week. If you haven't already, please do um, introduce yourself in the chat box. As I said already, you can use the chat box throughout the session. Um, so if you have any questions or you'd like to make any comments, please do use it. Um, and a little bit of housekeeping. So you can have your camera on or off it's up to you but we do ask that um when you're not speaking you put yourself on mute so we can hear the person who is and there is no feedback and i'll hand over to barry who will go through this week's key messages thank you una uh thank you champions for joining us again uh this uh, this wednesday afternoon um, uh, more good news, uh, champions. Uh, what we are seeing is the number of new infections has continued to decrease. So you will see on that first line that the our seven day rate uh, within Merton is now in double figures. Uh, um, which is really positive news. So that's just under about 100 uh, per 100,000 residents. So what that effectively means, there's give or take, there's around 30 new infections each day. That is still too high. Uh, we need to get that lower. It's really important that we're able to drive those new infections lower so that we can, uh, if you remember, live with COVID so our contact tracing services can, can, do, their, can do their work. Um, I had a very quick look at the data from today uh, just before I joined. Um, and today's figures was 14. So again, the, the continued decline in um, infections across London and Merton is good, but we need to do more. Um, enhanced testing champions, you've heard me talk before about this enhanced testing program related to Pollard's Hill. The Pollard's Hill program finished on the 17th of February and really positively we, we got a fantastic response from our residents and we've picked up no additional variants of concern within that testing. Um, since our last meeting, uh, we have been identified, sorry, notified um, that there was a one case, one single case uh, in the Wimbledon Park ward, and so we have started a similar program of enhanced testing in Wimbledon Park, which started on the 26th. So that was on Friday. So we're actively encouraging all those who live, work, or travel to Wimbledon Park to take part in a, a, an enhanced testing program, which means getting a one-off PCR test. Uh, there's information on the website about how you can access those tests, but essentially you can go to a mobile testing unit, so at Wimbledon Park Golf Club or behind the Wicks Car Park uh, to get a, a test at the mobile testing unit, or you can pick up or drop off at the Christ the King Church Hall. Again, we're seeing a fabulous response from our community in Wimbledon Park. We're seeing residents coming forward, the businesses in the area, the schools, the care homes, those additional settings. Community groups are doing outstanding work with us. Uh, Una, who's one of our champions with us today as a councillor as well, is really supporting that effort. So thank you to everyone who is taking part. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take part in that testing and you are within those, those eligible criteria, then please do so. It helps us track any spread of that South African variant and it's a really important program for us. Um, as we know, champions, we spoke last week about the new roadmap uh, and step one starts on Monday. Um, and so the first big step on that roadmap is schools opening. 
Um, as I've said to you before, our school leaders, our staff working in education are working incredibly hard um, to make sure that our schools are safe um, and they've put additional protective measures in. So they're working incredibly hard on risk assessments, they're taking part in testing regimes, um, but there is still uh, a risk that we could see a rise in cases uh, due to step one of the roadmap. If you remember, that's why there are five weeks in between step one and step two, so that we can see the imp any potential impact of the opening of step one before the national government makes decisions on proceeding to step two. Um, test and trace, you've heard me talk about this again. I've got I'm become like a broken record telling you the same messages, but hopefully that's consistency for you. Um, but test and trace is a really important part as we're constantly trying to drive those new infections down. So anybody with symptoms, even mild, if you're not too sure whether it's a loss of sense of taste or smell, please take that cautious approach and self-isolate and get a test from the NHS. Um, we're also strongly encouraging our frontline staff and volunteers uh, and carers, so apologies, to take part in regular asymptomatic testing. These are the lateral flow tests, lateral flow devices, and you are able to book a test from uh, Merton Council's website at Morden Assembly Halls and our network of community pharmacies across the borough. These are going to be really important, a part of that roadmap about opening up different parts of society, retail, hospitality, that we encourage all those who are frontline staff, carers and volunteers to take part in that testing programme. An additional um, programme started uh, on Monday, so it was released on Sunday, national press release from the government. And what we have now is that we're able to offer LFTs, so uh, asymptomatic testing, for households or bubbles of school staff and pupils. Essentially what this means is if you have a child, a uh, young person at home, um, um, then you are able to access um, uh, LFTs in a different way. We're trying to make it working with the national government as easy as possible for people to access LFTs. So part of that approach, the link is on there, we'll send this out to you. You're able to pick up a box of LFTs. So in this box there are seven tests, we're making it as easy as possible. So if you have young people in the house, you're able to access these to do them at home. So you do not need to go to a community pharmacy uh, or our Morden Assembly Hall sites, you can do it all at home. <clears throat> the other route for to get access to the box of tests is you can order online. If you're in that eligible group, as in you have young people at the house uh, in home, I ordered this box on Monday afternoon and Royal Mail delivered them on Tuesday morning. So again, it's making it as easy as possible for groups to access these testing programs. Um, it is still a swab, which we all know is not particularly pleasant, but um, as part of our testing program to drive down those new infections, break chains of transmission, uh, we're encouraging all those groups to take part. Um, as we know, testing by itself does nothing. Uh, the important part of this is test and isolate. Um, so if you do get a test, uh, sorry, I'll slow down. If you do get a positive result, it's really important to stay at home with the rest of your household to break that chain of transmission. And when you get those text messages, those phone calls, all the emails from Test and Trace, if you remember last week's session, we heard from our contact tracing colleagues, please respond to those messages because that really is how we're going to drive down those new infections. Last key message from me, because I can hand back to Una, because I'm really looking forward to listening to Karen and Jen, um, is around the, the vaccine. Um, about those residents that have already had their vaccine, firstly, thank you. Um, but secondly, they need to continue to follow the rules and guidance. So we need to continue to follow the non-pharmaceutical interventions, hands, face and space, um, and clearly the ventilation is an important part of that. And if they get symptoms, if you get symptoms and you've had your vaccine, still get a test, isolate and get a test, it's really important. And if you're part of those groups that are uh, regular asymptomatic testing, then continue taking part in that testing regime. If you're working in a school or you're in a care home or you have young people at home, then continue to take part in those testing programmes. Um, that's it from me, champions, today. I'll hand over to Una uh, to take lead on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Um, I've seen some really good questions in the chat box, um, which we'll come back to in Champions Corner. Um, but thank you all for putting those in. It's been it's been really helpful. Um, I'm going to hand you, you all over to Karen, who's going to speak about her experience as a volunteer 
in the vaccination sites. Um, so over to you, Karen. Hi there, uh, my name's Karen. I volunteer at the Vaccine Hubs largely, and I've been doing that since the beginning, really. Um, I've also done a little bit of phoning of patients, so they're the sorts of things that, that you can get involved in. Um, if I just expand, I'm going to talk a little bit about my duties, my experiences and the challenges and a little bit about patient expectations and what patients, uh, what it would be useful for people to consider before they come to the hub. I think it is, it's quite useful for everybody. Um, so the Wilson and the Nelson, they're the two hubs. We're also doing pop-ups within the community now. I just wanted to mention that because mosques are being done. Um, I'm going to a church and I'm really excited about the in the community locations and um, I'm going to a community centre as well. So you can see it's evolving all the time. The duties of the volunteer, um, they're the same largely at each hub. Um, but what makes the difference really is the people. People make the day interesting, challenging, and it's been really a meaningful experience, um, very moving, very humbling experience to be involved in this. And you feel a little bit like you're a part of history. Um, so we have to manage the patient flow. That's our main objective and the experience that people have as they go through the hub. There's also a certain amount of managing uh, patient expectations involved. And I will say, if anyone on here is actually volunteering at the moment and thinks I've said misspoken <laughs> or would like to add anything, please do put something in the chat box. Um, so as part of that process of managing the patient flow, um, there are kind of four stations in a hub. And if you've watched the video that was put um, on the WhatsApp, I think you can clearly see the four stations. The first station is the screening station where we're really screening. Uh, uh, we do that at the door or just outside the door. We're screening really about COVID and um, we're also checking that you have an appointment. So, so those are the two things that go on there. Within that, we also as volunteers have to respond to queries and obviously we liaise a lot with the clinical staff and the ops leads within the hub but you get to a point where you've asked the same question 150 times over and you might know the answer by now so um, one of the types of queries we get i can give you an example is um, if you're asking someone have they traveled internationally in the last 14 days and they say yes and i've self-isolated for 10 days you then have to manage their expectation because that person is going to say, I've done my 10 days of isolation and I have to say you can't be vaccinated for 14 days. That difference can be quite upsetting for some people. And so it's important to be able to say that, that these lengths of time post COVID um, positive tests and to do with this international travel are because the vaccine's not quite as effective, they believe and they want to be 100% certain that it's going to, to, to be extremely effective. So those are the sorts of questions you can get as you're screening at the door. And we do have shift leads, um, other volunteers like myself, I do this as well, and we come and, and help out in those situations. The next stage is the pre-registration uh, administration. Um, I say that because we have we now are quite modern we have qr codes and labels and things so it's all quite high tech now we were doing this all by hand and it really slowed the, the queues down so really really grateful that we have this wonderful technology now um, so you'll get a qr code you'll get all your information on it unless you've booked on the same day and we will then ask you for your details and your information and put that on a little piece of paper for you um, you may well be asked this information again or to clarify when you're vaccinated because there are actually the uh, proper admin staff who are putting this stuff onto your medical record. They're embedded with the vaccinators. You'll see them there. You then progress from this registration station to the vaccine room where really volunteers don't play a huge role. We may direct queues if we're very busy. We may be managing that flow. Um, but the next stage at which you're more likely to see a volunteer is in the observation room. Um, and it is a clinical requirement for Pfizer that we observe people for 15 uh, minutes um, and they cannot do this in the car. It has to be in front of us. With AstraZeneca, we're finding that uh, in the beginning it was said nobody had to be observed, but there are some people who 
doctors ask for them to, to sit for 10 to 15 minutes and be observed. Also, this is not clinical need. If somebody's driving, they're asked to sit for 10 to 15 minutes, either in the car or in the hub. So the observation room is really about just making sure that everybody's well and safe and um, they can leave the environment um, in the way they came in on two feet, hopefully. And that's largely what happens. Um, so the other thing we do, we, we actually have to manage the queues. To be honest, as we progress through the younger cohorts, as we have more technology, the queuing has got a lot better. But we do have to prioritise people sometimes with less mobility or who are challenging in some way because of underlying issues and who we feel it would be beneficial for all to progress through this hub um, as quickly as possible and maybe slightly separate. So, I mean, I think the message to get out is for people not to be upset if uh, they see a volunteer accompanying somebody to the front of a queue. We're not doing it because they're our mates. We're doing it because there's a clinical need and it's beneficial for everybody in the hub because our job is also to keep people safe. So we will ask people being vaccinated to wear masks. We will ask, you know, to put the mask up um, to keep a safe distance. Um, so they're the four stations largely. At the back of all of that is the admin that the volunteers do, which has reduced a lot because we now have modern day things like ticket machines. We were handwriting numbers and things. Um, we prep your vaccine cards um, and that does take a little bit of time. Uh, and that's probably the biggest part of the admin that, that we have to do now. Um, and I would say to, to get that message out for people to really make sure they don't lose those cards. It's not easy for us. We can't just write that information out again very easily. So do try and encourage people to look after those cards. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the experience and the challenges. As I said, it, it's very moving. I've seen people who've been shielding anywhere from three months to a year, some haven't been out of the house and, and some have crawled in. And when I say crawled in, you know, we, they get through the door and we put them on a chair, we vaccinate them in the corridor. Um, and the joy that some people have had at the idea that they might be able at some future point to see their grandchildren, their family. So it has been extremely moving. Um, I will also say it's been very interesting. It's been interesting to see the differences in communication style and progression through the hub and in the life stories as well. As, as we go through the age ranges, I think the challenges do change. Um, and I think when we talk about challenges, so mobility is a common one, obviously, with older people, with people with certain underlying conditions. But we're also seeing certain differences in communication style and pattern, and that needs managing as well, uh, you know, because people can um, be very anxious and have uh, um, uh, forms of difficulties that, that, that make their communication a little bit aggressive. One example is I had a man who was so anxious um, and had underlying health conditions, but not elderly, who would not progress through the hub at all. And I had to get vaccinated at the exit of the observation room to vaccinate and then put a chair out for that person to see where we could watch them. And they had a companion, which helped a lot. So we do try to be patient, understanding, and that's an expectation I think you should have and very professional. However, one of the things I do want to say, you know, we can't always accommodate every need. It's not possible for us to do drive-ins with everybody. I will say that, um, you know, if I think now, We've done about one vaccination in a car that I'm aware of. That if people cannot leave the house, we are now going into houses, or the vaccinators are going into, they're doing housebound visits. So I would say, to, again, to get that message out, that if mobility is such an issue that somebody can't get out of the car, uh, then, then maybe they should be vaccinated at home. Um, the other fact challenges children. Children are not allowed on site, but obviously that's easier said than done. And again, it's a message I'd like to personally get out that we would like people where possible to either, if they're with somebody, sit in the car while one gets vaccinated and then the other comes in or come at a time and we'll accommodate you. We'll leave messages to say, get this person straight through the hub. Um, if you've already been once with your children, we've asked you to come back later. Um, where it's really, so I had a newborn baby the other day, a woman with a newborn baby, there's not a lot one could do there. And we just literally, we were lucky, it was very quiet, straight through, 
in bring in a separate room for the observation so we try to keep everybody safe um, one of the things to consider is that some people as i've said before have not seen their own grandchildren for months you know maybe a year and uh, because of the risk and it's unfair then to put them in front of other people's children who they may deem equally a, a risk but it's also i think Vaccine hubs are not a children's playground. We can't have children running about the hub. So if again, we try to work with people on that, but, but if people can find a way, it's much better. They don't bring the children to the hub. Another challenge is language issues. And again, this is quite an interesting one because people have to, we have to know if they've had COVID, we have, we have to give consent to the vaccination effectively. So um, another message that's useful, although we can call language line, although we can try talking to someone on the phone, this can take an awful lot of time and I've seen it happen. Um, again, if somebody has a language issue, it's really good if they do have somebody who can come with them and translate and who knows them, you know, but, but certainly that who can translate. Um, generally, um, people aren't encouraged to come with anyone or to progress through the hub with anyone. We do prefer people not to come into the hub. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that, that's about it. I mean, one of the, the things about this that's been joyous is that we are working with experienced clinicians, the NHS, and there's just so much cooperation, collaboration. There's, there's not a hierarchy. We all, as a volunteer, we have WhatsApp groups with and Dr. Moham Sekram, who's been on here, he manages all of that brilliantly. But we're always being asked for our opinion and our feedback and how we can improve the service. And we're always willing to hear if people have had a particular experience and they have suggestions. I, uh, you know, we're, we're very keen to hear about those. So for me, it's been a really, really productive experience, it really has. And, and I've really appreciated being involved. Thank you, Karen. And thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us about your experience. That's been so insightful. Um, if anyone has any questions for Karen, um, we'll move on to Champions Corner. Um, but I've just seen a few questions in the chat box as well. Um, Lisa, you had a question about LFTs and the um, enhanced testing program. Would you like to come off mute? Yeah, so I was just wondering, because I live in the Wimbledon Park area, um, I am getting LFTs regularly, but would I still need to go for the enhanced testing as well? Thank you, Lisa. Really important for us to clarify. Firstly, thank you for taking part in regular LFT testing. Really important. Um, but the answer is yes. So the okay. enhanced testing program that we've put in place is an additional one off PCR test. So yes, please, if you would continue to if you would take up that enhanced testing as well as your your regular routine of testing. That's great. Really good question, Lisa. Thank you. OK, brilliant. And shall I do the second one now, Ina? Yeah, of course. Um, so Super. I was just wondering, clarification, because I have to admit, I do get a bit confused sometimes with all the information coming out and the changes that are being made. Am I correct in presuming that the vaccination itself just prevents things like death and hospital admission, but it doesn't stop you from actually contracting COVID-19 or passing it on? Thanks, really Lisa. Oh, we have Vasa on the call, Dr. Vasa, if I could pull you in to answer Lisa's question. Thank, thank you. And there's also a previous question on uh, um, antibiotic allergy and vaccine as well, isn't there, about chloroquine, um, anti-malarial, or also used in other conditions. So I'll answer that and I'll come to this as well. So uh, Barry, in the past, have we been able to share with all our uh, champions the list, the, the the list of what is in AstraZeneca, what is in Pfizer, because we have an ingredients list, like what goes in a cake, what goes in a carrot cake, and what goes in a banana cake or whatever. So we, we have a list of ingredients. So I think we didn't share the list of ingredients with everybody who, who is a champion. Uh, Selena or Nisha can give you that uh, list, because if you know what is in the vaccine, and, as, and we definitely know there is no chloroquine in either of these vaccines. So even if you had an anaphylactic reaction, where your lips swelled and your tongue swelled and you collapsed and you needed to go to hospital. Even if we had such a drastic reaction to chloroquine, both the vaccines are safe. 
because there is no chloroquine in either of these vaccines. But allergy is such a common question. I think we need to share the ingredient list. So that just like if you go if you go to have a meal, you, you find out what is in there. I think we need to know what is in this vaccine as well, in either of these two vaccines. So let's share the list. Let's be transparent as much as we can so that people know what is in them. Um, second question was about uh, what, what do these vaccines really do? So when we started off in December, we were talking about the purpose, the, the primary purpose of the vaccine was to reduce death and severe disease and hospitalization. We were not focusing that much at the beginning about transmission of disease, but as we went along, now that the disease has really hit us hard in January, December, January, and we know a lot about this, now we know that we have evidence to support that it does actually reduce uh, the, the the beneficial effect of vaccinating the population that you also reduce transmission but th that was not the primary purpose and i think we should just because we come out of january we mustn't forget uh, how drastic it is for death and destruction so for me that death, death and destruction alone does it as an indication of vaccine uh, because to me that that's really really important not to forget our dark days in better times uh, we really don't want to go there ever again so uh, yeah, so we'll talk about transmission, but never forget why we were so keen on getting the fastest possible vaccination campaign. And I'm really proud of it in England. We have really done very well uh, in, in how fast we got to where we got to, but we can't be satisfied. We've got to work harder. Uh, now we are doing double dosing as well. So the task is a little bit more complicated, but can be done, will be done. And obviously with your help and the help of volunteers at the site, we'll get there. So thank you, Vasa, because I was just wondering, obviously, at some point services are going to reopen. So it's just having a look and forward planning. Are we going to say no one's going to be allowed into communal areas regardless um, if they're keeping social distance and following the guidelines if they haven't had a vaccination? So it's just trying to forward plan. Yeah, I, at the moment, the, the, this, this, I think this raised to the debate about passports and uh, the, the need for certain occupations to have a vaccine. At the moment, we have no mandate to say that uh, this is going to be mandated as part of you entering a, a, a place of work or if you talk to my children, uh, they, they want to go partying somewhere. They, they want to turn up at a gig. Do they need to have, a, have the vaccine? So we really don't know these things yet. That will certainly motivate some people to take the vaccine. If you, if you say uh, you can go to this place, uh, uh, whatever place it is, each person has got a place they really want to go to. Uh, and I think it will motivate some people. But I don't think we need to have compulsion. I, I think that our society is mature enough uh, to have a discussion and, and appreciate that this vaccine is for us as an individual, but also us as a community. Thank you, Vasa. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Una, you have your hand up and then we'll have to move on. But if you've, anyone has any other questions, please do put them in the chat box. Um, yes, Una. Hi, it was just briefly just following on from um, the lady that was talking about um, testing in Wimbledon Park, because obviously I'm councillor there and we've had a very good take up of the testing. But I think it just would be useful to, to say to everyone on here, that if you know of anybody else that that hasn't done one and is either living or working or coming in and using the businesses it really is worthwhile to get one of the tests it's really easy to do it you can either book or as barry said go and get pick up a home test kit the only thing to note is it has to be done by thursday um close of play on thursday is my understanding and so um so, so yeah there's just a sort of couple more days left to do it um, and the other point was following on from the, the, the rules on the testing. Um, if you've had, if you've tested positive for COVID, you cannot have a this particular test um, within the last 90 days. Um, our son uh, regularly tests weekly with the LFDs and he couldn't do this test because, um, interestingly, because he had COVID um, in those, in that period. So, um, so otherwise, it's just 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 to mention that and to, to encourage everyone to, to, to do it. So thank you. Thanks, Una. 
Um, Kamiko, you have asked if you order an LFT online and it comes up positive, what happens? Do you have to go for an official test? So if you have a positive test from an LFT, you need to isolate. Um, that is a positive COVID result. Um, previously, you would have had to go for a PCR test, um, but at, as it stands at the moment, the LFTs um, are sufficient enough to um, a uh, positive result is sufficient enough from an LFT to, to for someone to have to isolate. I hope that answers your question. Sorry, Una, let me come in. Um, yeah. So uh, it's a constantly changing field and we're finding that we need to be incredibly nimble in our approach. So if you were to go to our, our supervised sites, so Morden Assembly Hall or Community Pharmacy, that responds the legal duty to isolate starts immediately and there is no requirement for a PCR. The tests that I kind of waved around earlier, I'm doing them at home and so there is a requirement if you are conducting these tests at home to get a confirmation PCR. PCR. We're going to make that really clear in the comms and the engagement and on our website um, because we're kind of learning as we go through. This This kind of came out very, very late in the day. But just to clarify, if you are taking part in the home testing programme, you do need to get a confirmation PCR. Thank you, Barry. Um, and so our workshop theme today, sorry, if anyone has any other questions, please do put them in the chat box or pop me an email and we'll get back to the, we'll send them out on Friday. Um, so our workshop theme today is on optimal aging and we have Jen joining us, who's a Darcy fellow from CLCH. Um, and it's, it follows on nicely from our key message last week on the approach to living with COVID um, and the importance of maintaining and improving healthy lifestyles. So, um, um, and it's also, um, it kind of represents how we've evolved as the champions as well over the past few months. Um, so we have brought things to this group in the past um, to sense check with you all, such as Better Health Merton. Um, and hopefully as we continue to evolve, um, more projects that are active, um, such as Optimal Aging can be brought to the, to the champions group. Um, so I'll hand over to Jen. Brill, thank you, Una. Um, can I change the slides? Can I take control or do I just need to shout next slide? Just shout next slide. Okay. Oh, it's, it's my moment. It's like doing a, a press briefing. Um, it's really lovely to be with you. As Una said, I'm Jen. Um, I'm a Darcy Fellow, um, which means that I'm doing a year of uh, clinical leadership training in the NHS. Uh, but in normal times, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, Phoebe, who is my colleague, actually can't be here today. We've both been redeployed to do some clinical work at the minute. And so she's working clinically today. Um, next slide, please, Una. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm here to introduce the Optimal Aging Programme, which is something that we um, are starting um, in Wandsworth and Merton. And um, it's really lovely to be doing this in Merton. It's, it's such a, a great borough. Everybody's so connected and enthusiastic. So it's really lovely to be here talking to you today. So what is the Optimal Aging Programme? Um, this silver haired chap is Samuel Gray. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a public health doctor. Um, and he uh, is responsible for setting up all the national screening. So if you've ever had screening for uh, cervical cancer or breast cancer or anything like that, he's the guy that set that up. Um, he's now in his 70s and he's turned his focus to helping people age well. So we're working with him in Merton. Um, and the idea is that we want to help the population of Merton and Wandsworth live longer, better. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so the reason why we're doing that, Una's already touched on that a little bit, but we all know that our population is aging, but actually the past year and the indirect of COVID has really had a huge impact on all of us, but in particular our older population. So Karen was mentioning um, when she was talking about the vaccination hubs that, you know, we're seeing mobility and deconditioning problems with some of our older population. So we want to try and improve health span, and I'll explain that as well in a moment, and well-being. And the overall aim, obviously, is to try and help reduce health and care needs um, so that people are more independent and having a better quality of life as they get older. 
Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, it's That's the million dollar question. Um, and there's loads of amazing stuff going on in Merton already. And it's not to try and put in um, new services or initiatives. That's, that's not the plan. It's to try and bring all of the people together who are leading those brilliant things um, and to try and work together as a system. So across healthcare services, across social care services, across the voluntary sector, across citizens um, like you and bringing everybody together and essentially we've got a very grand aim of uh, creating a cultural revolution about ageing so really counteracting um, uh, ageism in Merton um, and I'll explain a little bit about some of the things that we've got that will hopefully help us achieve that next slide so this is just explaining why I, I don't need to explain this I'm sure you know it but this uh, side by side is ones with the Merton so Merton um, on the right side in the green and that's the population um, now um, and if we flip to the next slide um, it just shows that the um, that that uh, bulk at the top uh, of our people over 65 um, goes from about 12% of our total population in Merton to nearly 19. So in, and that's in 20 years, that's in 2040. So we've already got that big increase just in that next 20 year period. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is, this is the health span that I was talking about. So what we want to try and do is come together and increase health span. We're not necessarily trying to increase um, people's lifespan and how long they live. Um, some people may want to live to 118, who knows, but um, not many people do actually. What they want to do is, is to live their life as well as they can for as long as they can. So what we're trying to do is squash that period at the end of people's lives where they're more dependent, they have perhaps care needs, um, a quality of life not, might not be so great, they can't get around as much, and try and squash that into as short a period of time as possible. So increasing health span. Next slide. And the good news is that the science now tells us that that really is possible, and it's possible through some quite straightforward ways. So if I just introduce this graph, um, a good, a good graph for a, for a Wednesday afternoon. Um, so we've got this, this, if we look at this, the black line on the graph, we've got, it's going up and then it's coming down. So essentially that's our two phases of life. We've got growth and development, and then we've got essentially downhill <laughs> towards when we reach our end of life. But what we're trying to say is that, that there is an inevitability that we will get older. Of course, we are all getting older minute by minute, as I speak now, we're getting older. Um, hopefully, I'm not making it feel like that. Um, and but but what we can do is we can slow the rate at which um, we have a decline in ability. So that point where we move from that growth and development to that point where we start to decline a bit, it will vary depending on who you are and what your background is and what your job is. Um, but depressingly, it's around the age of our mid twenties is when we start that slight decline because lots of us get jobs, we're sitting at desks, we're driving and we become a bit more sedentary. So what we want to try and do is follow that top line that's coming down. That's our best possible performance as we get older, our best, um, our best rate of decline as we get older. But often what we're finding is that people are following that bottom line. And, you know, COVID is one of the reasons why people might now perhaps be following that bottom line where their, their ability and their performance is declining faster. But the good news is, after I've just depressed you with all of that, um, is that we know that actually ageing in itself, so the ageing process in itself, doesn't have really big impacts on our ability and that decline until actually we hit our 90s. There are three things that really have an impact. One of them is fitness, so loss of fitness. The second is disease, some of which we just have to be lucky to avoid, but some of which we can avoid by keeping fit. So back to that first one. So being fit, disease, and the third one is negative thinking and um, attitudes and beliefs around getting older that feeds in to back to that first one again, to keeping active and being fit because we think, oh, well, it's just that I'm getting older. I can't possibly carry on doing that. And we all, you know, we all have those thoughts. I hit my 40s last year and, you know, I was thinking, oh, gosh, well, I can't be training for another marathon. Absolutely not. Now is the time. 
Um, so the good news is that we can do something about it. And the real key thing that we can do is to keep active and to keep fit. Next slide. And again, as I've already said, it's quite a stark picture. So this was actually a report that came out last autumn. So this was pre our second big lockdown. So actually we might find that this is worse now, but um, they, they did a survey of older people and they found that 20% of people felt less steady, 25% of people were able to work, uh, walk less far in that older population. So the time is now, um, we were developing all of this before, but now is really the time because of, because of COVID. Next slide. Um, so my colleague Phoebe, she's a palliative care doctor by background, and this is what she would normally talk about. But not only do we need to um, live as well as we can, so that health span, but also it's about when we do get to that point of end of life, it's about planning for dying well. So this statistic is about uh, actually quite a lot of people, um, seven out of 10 people feel comfortable talking about dying, but actually we're only having those kind of conversations with about one in 10 people. So there's lots that we can do to start having conversations and changing the culture about having conversations around dying and, and, and planning to die well and in the way that we want. Next slide. So what are we going to do about it? Um, so. The Optimal Aging Programme is this big programme we're, we're, we're trying to achieve these aims to help people live well and to help people die well. Um, so we're taking this approach um, through a number of different means. So the, we're, we've created, or with Muir, who um, has created um, something called the Optimal Aging Learning Programme that is as relevant for me as a physio, um, <laughs> for you as COVID champions, for your family members, for uh, barriers, a, a, a public health professional, all of those kind of things. Um, we are, it, it's as relevant for everybody to really share that knowledge. Some of the stuff that I've just talked through, but there's loads more. And if we really understand that, we can start changing our, our thoughts and our attitudes and our behaviours about, about getting older. And we can embed that across the whole system and across the borough. So that already exists and we're, but what we'd also like to do is work with citizens um, and share it with them and get feedback about what's good, what's bad, what would work, how we can share it better um, and try and co-develop some of that stuff. The second thing we're doing, um, and I don't want to dwell on this too much today, but um, we are also developing a new digital hub, hub acknowledging the fact that we're, we're, we were in a digital world and we're really in a digital world now as a result of COVID. So um, we're very mindful of the fact that um, we need to think about digital exclusion, inclusion, literacy and access, but we're developing a new digital hub that helps reach people directly to provide them resources, to provide them the optimal aging learning program so that they can um, th they can um, understand all of that information about what happens to them when they get older and give them opportunities um, to keep active and put this into practice. And then the third thing is that we are creating these live longer better networks. So we, we want to have a live longer better a live longer better network in Merton. Um, and the idea is that will be a group of, of about 15 really interested, passionate people about um, about counteracting this ageism. Um, and I'll talk a bit later about um, how that might be something that we'd be interested to talk to you more about. So the idea is that through these things, we'll create this cultural revolution, we'll help people live longer, better, compress that period of disability at the end of life and reduce the need for health and social care. So next slide. I'm conscious of time, actually, so I might I'll, I'll, I'll speak really quickly about this. But um, the so the digital platform that I talked about, just this is um, information. And if you're interested in it, please do let me know um, if you want to know a bit more. But um, we're trialing this now. So in um, Mohan and Sai's uh, practice uh, in East Merton at Wideway Practice, uh, we've just, in fact, today, we've just um, rolled out um, the first trial of this new digital platform with some patients at Wideway Practice. And the idea is that we'll start rolling that out to more and more people. It's very much at a prototype stage. 
so um, we're really trying to get lots of information about what works, what doesn't, what content is good, um, what the design could be like and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so we're, we're working on that um, with patients via the GP surgeries. In a, to, to explain it in a very um, uh, basic way, I suppose the idea is that it will be a really, um, a really trusted source of information but essentially an NHS wellness Facebook is what we're aiming for so we'll have a news feed of um, good stuff from your GP and um, any of your healthcare professionals um, it will link you in with um, maybe charities that are relevant to you so um, you may have just had a diagnosis of diabetes and it will pop up with some information about perhaps a local diabetes group in your area that you might want to join so sending you lots of really nice personalized information that can help you really take control control of your own health and well-being. Um, next slide, please, Una. Actually, we can skip. We can skip to the next one. Um, I'll scooch over that one. So, um, I, uh, oh, can we go back to the working with citizens one? Um, so, uh, one of the things that Phoebe and I were really keen to talk to you about was obviously I've just talked about the um, involvement that we'll have from citizens and the digital side of things but on the non-digital side of things so that network and how we can work together as a system um, and and change that culture around aging and spread that throughout the population and um, our particular area of interest so obviously for me as a physio I'm really interested in uh, physical activity and people keeping active and aging well and as I said Phoebe um, is interested in talking about conversations about planning for a good death so we're both putting together some focus groups. We've got some dates in the diary, actually, and perhaps if I, we've got some information that perhaps I can share with Una that she could um, spread to the group because we would really love you to be involved. Um, we we would like to chat with you. Um, we've got some Zoom sessions for an hour, just small small sessions, uh, just to ask you a couple of questions. Um, so for me, it's what does aging mean to you, and what does being active as you get older mean to you, um, and that will help us form the work that we're doing. And similarly with Phoebe, she wants to ask the question, what would matter most to you if you were at, towards the end of your life? Um, and, you know, what, what is really important to you at that stage? So as I've mentioned, we're very conscious from the digital side of things about digital literacy and access. And um, we've been working with groups in Merton who already um, who's, you know, who've really got that as one of their priorities and that they're working on initiatives to try and help get people online. Um, either um, I think there's three things that we've talked about it's not having a device not having the confidence or the skills and, and not having it not having the internet so um, not having the internet is a hard nut to crack and we are trying to lobby BT and other corporates to see if we can help with that but um, but uh, not having the device not having the skills there are lots of groups already doing some really good work on that so we're working with them and then the second thing to point out is health uh, inequalities. Um, we're very conscious of that and we'd be really keen to know from you about how we might through our focus groups re reach diverse voices from across Merton. So we want to make sure that we're speaking to people who represent the real population of the borough. Next slide. So here's just a quick timeline. Um, things have been skewed a little bit with uh, with COVID and with vaccines and distractions. But um, as I said today, we've we've just launched the pilot um, with lots. There's been lots of prep and planning. So the digital pilot started today with actual patients from GP surgery. Um, and we are in the process of forming those people who are going to create our live longer, better networks. And then the plan is that um, in about in May time, we'll um, in about April time, we'll launch those and we'll have an event. It's such a shame we won't be able to do it in person, but we'll 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 figure something out virtually. Um, these are the times that we're in, um, and then um, obviously as time goes on, we'll be evaluating and analysing all of the feedback that we get um, and planning on what we're going to do to help change that culture around ageing. Next slide. So your involvement um, generally. I would love to know your thoughts on the project and its aims and if there's any content or groups within Merton that you know about or have and that you'd like that content to be on the digital platform that people are trialling at the minute, we'd love to hear from you. But really our key ask is if you would like to be involved in those three focus groups that I talked about, so that one on ageing well and being active and the other on planning for a good death and we can give you the details of those um, afterwards. Um, and also we'd love to hear from you about directly accessing diverse and representative voices um, and any contacts or groups that you're involved in who would who would 
um, be keen to speak to us. And finally, um, that network is going to be 12 to 15 health and care professionals, community leaders, um, that includes people like you. So be really interested if there's anybody who be keen to fly the flag on that Live the Long Better network in Merton. And I think that brings us to the end, a whistle stop tour. Thanks, Jen. I'm afraid was... I, don't, I, haven't got, I haven't got access to the chat, so apologies. Um, I can't see anything in the chat. It's telling me that um, I can't access it. Okay, I can, well, don't worry, I'll go through. We've had a couple of questions. Um, Asha, you had a question about entry points. Do you want to come off mute and ask Jen? Yes, um, that was an excellent presentation, Jen, brilliant. Um, Thank you. And I, because I'm part of the older age group, I'm, I'm particularly interested because um, you talked about, you know, conversation about dying and dying points. How do you prepare for it? It's a difficult topic. It's not something that's commonly discussed. Um, and I'm part of a local community of elders who are in their 90s and I'm in my 70s. I'd just like to know, you know, how do we find these entry points? And what are those institutions that can help us with it? Yeah, that's a really good question, Asha. Thank you very much. Um, I'm I'm sorry that my colleague Phoebe isn't here to answer it because that's very much her um, area of expertise. But she's been doing a lot of work with um, the palliative care and the end of life community in Merton, um, and she's working um, with a, a team of people um, from an organisation called Compassionate Communities, um, and their whole purpose is to um, try and help communities with those kind of conversations and to help exactly like you said to um, help people with those entry points so if you want to talk to Phoebe in more detail about that um, I um, it's it's not my area of expertise but she I'm sure she would love to speak to you Asha and and, and involve you in that it would be great because I think it it would help me but it also help mm. the group that I'm part of um, and I think this is a very good initiative that you're uh, following or setting up. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, please, please do let me have your contact details, or, or I'll get them through Una, and and we can we can contact you. Yeah, yeah I'll put you, you both in touch um, Thank after you. this presentation. Thanks, Thank Asha. Um, Fasa, your hand is up. Yes. I wanted to say thank you for both the above presentations because I think they are really, really important where we move uh, this whole discussion about frailty and di dying out of my practice room into the community because uh, we, it shouldn't happen when you are ill and when you are frail and when, when you are really struggling. It's far better to have these discussions long before you are really frail and really struggling because sometimes I find when I raise this discussion when people are really ill, they get the wrong message. They think I'm giving up. I'm not giving up. I really want to make life better. But I can understand why people think, is he really giving up on me now? So I think long before that sentiment sinks in, it's far better to, to deal with this when you are well, when you are up for a challenge, when you are up for a debate. And I think that's really why I like this concept to start pre being unwell, uh, pre being needed need to go to the physio because you can't walk to the toilet from your bedroom. So really great stuff. Please join this. I think as a society, as a community, we didn't like to talk about frailty. We didn't like to talk about mm. dying. But I think COVID has taught us, you know, it, death will come to us one way or another. And I know hiding from ultimately that we all have to leave this place. So I think we can open up a little bit more as a community, cry a bit more, feel a bit sad a bit more, because COVID has also taught us emotion is not prohibited, emotion is totally permitted. So I think we just open this up, talk about it. But if you want to come and talk to talk to me about it in my room, you're welcome too. But I think there are other better, kinder, nicer places than me having this chat. But you're welcome here. There's another question there, Una, uh, about uh, vaccine supply um, and choice. And I, think, and I think the whole thing about choice and supply has always been up for discussion from the very beginning. Um, I think we have been fortunate in Merton that we have had a very good supply of vaccines and that we have been able to give so many uh, in Merton, which I'm really grateful and uh, pleased that we have really had that supply. And yes, at times people will say, I wish this was here today or that was there today. But in the, in, in the scheme of things, I think 
I'm really pleased with, with, with the supply we have received and what we are given. And, and my patients, yeah, sometimes there may be a little bit of frustration, but, but when we explain, most people, almost all people, I should be honest and say, actually do understand uh, the, the scheme of things and what's going on. And I think we should really thank all the volunteers who are coming to our practices, uh, for being at the vaccination sites. They are really helping us in, in this. And I think one, one can safely say, without the volunteers, we would not have immunized 20 million plus people in, in, in two months, um, in the middle of the, middle of the cold winter. Uh, I, think, I think that is the testament to all your support and the encouragement um, you provide not only encouragement to the people who come into the vaccination sites, you actually provide encouragement to clinicians who are working there as well, because there's a, there's a warm atmosphere and there's a real friendship uh, relationship, mutually supportive relationship you could see in these vaccination sites. So keep it going and thank you. Thank you, Vasa. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point and um, it was great to hear Karen's experience of being a volunteer earlier as well. Some fantastic work that's taking place. Um, just before we go, Una, you have your hand up. Is that a legacy hand? Sorry, I'm on mute. Yeah, sorry, I, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. It says raise hand. But anyway, so sorry oh, about that. Yeah, there must be okay. something weird. No problem. I just didn't want to miss you if you had your hand up. Um, <laughs> if we do, we have any more questions? I'll just look in the in the chat box for either Jen or Vasa before we go. CMC. Yeah, there's a comment about CMC, Una. I think we can. We need to talk about CMC properly one day. What is CMC? Uh, because CMC now permits people, citizens, to actually edit their own record. So I think to do justice to CMC, invite CMC one day uh, and then we can talk about CMC. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, we'll get that on the agenda for one of the sessions soon. Um, thanks everyone for coming along this afternoon. Just to go through our next steps. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please do send me an email. I think you all have my email address. Um, or you can put it in the chat box at any point, um, even after the session's ended and I can pick it up as well. Um, our next drop in session is the 10th of March. So the same times again, 12 to 1 and 7 to 8. Um, we do ask that you share the key messages this week um, and the resources that we forward to you on Friday. We share with you on Friday and forward on to your communities and networks, your family and friends. Um, and thank you, Vasa, Karen, and Jen for joining us this afternoon. It's been a really great session. So thank you all. It's really appreciated. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.